glad you're all here this morning. Uh, we have a great uh, Sunday school class that's going to be led here by Drew Rick Miller. And he is with the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, and his, most of his work that he's done since uh, he finished seminary has been uh, how religion and science kind of interact. Uh, he also, as you all know, is uh, the proud, proud uh, son-in-law of George and <laughs> Bess. George, your, your seat's in the back of the room. <laughs> and a husband to Catherine, and brother-in-law to uh, John and Ren, Margaret and James. Uh, so we're so grateful that you are here today to teach. And I look forward to what you have to share. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, and I have to kind of preface my comments here is that I'm not in the official capacity of an employee of the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, I'm here to share some ideas about how science and faith interact uh, and to do what the foundation believes in and what I firmly believe in, and that is the importance of having this conversation in the church. Uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more in the presentation, but I think it's an extremely important conversation that the church be engaging culture, be engaging the world of ideas, and in particular science. Uh, and in my experience, that doesn't happen enough, although I think it happens more here at First Pres than in some other churches. So I want to uh, focus the conversation today on the scientific study of religion. Uh, and science and religion is a fairly big field, largely in the academy. And the first question I want to ask is what's at stake? In have, why, why should we have this conversation between science and religion? What's the point? So what? What matters? Well, I think the first one is uh, all of us cannot avoid the media uh, and all the criticism coming against religion in popular media today. Uh, many of you probably recognize at least one face on the screen there. These are uh, three of the four horsemen of new atheism, as they're called, uh, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, and Christopher Hitchens, who recently passed away. And there's very, very strong statements, largely coming from scientists, uh, that talk about the irrelevance of religion, how science explains away religion. There's no need for religion's a thing in the past that we don't need anymore. And so one, one reason for having this conversation is to respond to these criticisms, to have a voice in that conversation. This is a quote many of you have probably seen from Francis Crick that is indicative of the kinds of criticisms you get. The astonishing hypothesis is that you your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. In essence, you are nothing but a pack of neurons. That's the kinds of statements that we're hearing from New atheists, and that's the kinds of criticisms levied against all religions. I think it goes a level deeper, though. Uh, many of you have probably seen in the news the, the trends of religion in America and the growth of what they're calling the religious nuns. Uh, Pew recently did a study, here's a, a graph from their research. There's not a whole lot of atheists in America. That percentage remains pretty low. But if you look at the growth of people that just don't see the relevance of religion in their lives, that number is increasing. Uh, and there is some work that's being done that indicates one of many factors in why there's that growth of the nuns is because the church is not engaging in difficult topics like science. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I'm here and, and, and what I feel called to do is to have that conversation, to facilitate that conversation. So one of the things that's at stake is this response to critics. I think there's another that is actual benefits to us as religious people. I think there are benefits within the space of religion from having this conversation. I've experienced them in my own life and seen them in, in conversations when they've gone on in churches. And one of the things that I find most exciting about it, we don't do enough of it, but when you really wrestle with these issues, what kind of God created the universe that we live in? Why did God create it this way? Why is my mind, my body, the universe, the huge, vast history of the universe, why is it that way? Why did God create it that way? Those are deeply theological questions. Uh, and in my experience and in having conversations with other people, our understanding of God changes when we engage in this conversation. So that is, that is one of the, the, the most important benefits, I think, occur from having this conversation. There's another more practical one, uh, and it deals more with what I'd like to talk about today in the scientific study of religion. 
There's more work being done by scientists using the tools of science to study religion. And they're beginning to tell us what works. What of our practices, what of the things we do as religious people work? Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, but that's another area that comes from having this conversation. We can test some of our practices, some of our ideas, and find out do they really have the benefits that we believe they have. So science and religion, as I said, is a very big field. There's a lot of different areas uh, that have made it up. These are just a few. Um, and I could, we could do a 10-week course on any one of these themes, not just 30 minutes or so that we have this morning. Today I want to focus on the scientific study of religion. Uh, and many people would say that's probably the most difficult area. There's a long history in faith and reason. There's a lot of theologians that have engaged in, in you know, what does, what does the science of um, the origins of the universe, how does that relate to a theology of creation? There's lots of work of that sort. There's been much less done on the church's side on theology regarding the scientific study of religion. So I decided, let's take that on. Before I do so, though, I want to make a couple statements, and there, there's a few points that I, that I want to really emphasize in this presentation, and this is one of them. There's others that you can fall asleep, you can think about what the choir is singing, or your sermon, or whatever comes up, but these are a couple of the key ones. And the first that I want to focus on is what are the domains of science, and what are the, domain, the proper domain of religion? And this is a very, very simple claim. I think most scientists would agree. But science is more or less designed to exclusively study natural phenomena. Science is limited to studying things in the natural world that we can see, that we can touch, that we can observe, that we can use mathematical formulas to test. There's a few exceptions. Someone could raise their hand and say, well, what about string theory or the multiverse? Those aren't things that we can see or touch. Science is engaging them, so there are some exceptions here. But more or less, science can only talk about, it's only designed to deal with natural phenomena. So that's, that's one of the most important statements I want to make here today. And then the correlate to that in talking about religion, religion typically deals with both natural phenomena. They talk about how we are to live our lives, what rituals, what, what things we do, what we do when we're in church. Those are natural things that could be studied uh, as natural phenomena, but it also deals with the non-natural or the supernatural. Uh, and that's the case in almost all religions. There's some element of the sacred or the supernatural, and that's what makes re religion different. So this distinction between natural, supernatural, or natural and the non-natural, that's a key distinction to hold whenever you're having a conversation between science and religion uh, and talking about you know, whose territory are we speaking of now. That, that natural versus non-natural distinction is important. All right, any questions, comments, before I dive into the scientific study of religion? All right, let's keep it moving then. So there are lots of ways. The, the foundation I work for, one of the main things we do, I'd say over half of our funding goes into the scientific study of religion studying forgiveness, studying prayer, um, studying demographic trends of how religion is developing across the globe. And so here's, a, here's just a handful of the fields or the way. So in sociology, you have um, the, the Pew data that I showed, looking at the religious nuns or looking at the rise of Pentecostalism in the global south, giving us data that 84% of the world is religious, affiliates with a religious community. So you've got that kind of information coming out of the sociological domain. You have anthropological and archaeological research that is starting to study the role of religion in various cultures, past and present, uh, and beginning to tell us very interesting things about them. You have a lot of work in psychology and the cognitive science. Uh, the psychology of religion is a, is a growing field. Cognitive science of religion, which we're going to spend some time talking about this morning, is a growing field. You have work that's looking at the biological aspects of religion. So what's going on in the brain? How did it evolve? Does, does religion actually have an impact on my physiology, on my biology? And that's another area where work is, is beginning to be done. And then you have a lot of work in the spirituality and health area, which is, is probably the most widely known, where scientists, public health professionals, 
others are studying the impact of religion on health. It's a huge area. It's one we could, again, do a multi-week course on. Um, what I want to focus primarily on today is one example in the psychological cognitive, particularly the cognitive science of religion, and I hope to have a little bit of time to talk about neuroscientific studies of religion as well, which would be more in the biological domain, what's actually going on in our brains uh, during religious experiences and, and religion. So let's go into the cognitive science of religion. So one of the key things we're learning from this study is that there are agents everywhere, and our minds are designed to detect agents everywhere. There's a, there's a range of studies, um, but our minds are designed to know something's going on out there, outside of my mind, and detect where things are happening. So imagine with me for a moment that you are in Africa. You just set up camp. You're settling down for the night. And you hear a noise in the bushes. What's your first reaction going to be? It's going to be fear, right? You're not going to think, oh, that's just the wind. I'm not going to worry about it. You're going to think, this guy's in the woods right outside of your camp. And there's good reasons for doing so. This is a phenomenon that happens to humans everywhere. Any activity out there, our senses are designed cognitively to find agents out there. And there's good reason for it. The cognitive scientists have come up with this wonderful term called HAD. It's called our hyperactive agency detection device. <laughs> Say that five times fast. <laughs> That's your homework for today. <laughs> Um, and so the, the, this, this ability to, to see agency everywhere, we use it in a range of areas. We use it out in the woods or at home at night when the lights are out to wonder what is that noise? What is, is that just the wind? Is that just the rain? Is that just a train? Or is somebody breaking into my house? We use it there, but we also use it in our interaction with one another. And it takes some different forms, this agents everywhere. So another key concept that cognitive science, scientists of religion are looking at is this idea called theory of mind. Very simply stated, that is, I have the ability to attribute mental states to each one of you, and you have the ability to attribute mental states back to me. So you're all sitting here wondering, what's this guy from the John Templeton Foundation in Philadelphia talking about? You're trying to figure that out, and I'm up here wondering, are you listening to me or are you replaying action from the game last night in your mind <laughs> where Johnny Menzel did not succeed on that play? We have this ability and we can attribute these mental states. Children develop this ability very, very young. We all have it. It's key to our survival, our social interaction, our health, our well-being. The, the, the progress of culture is dependent on this ability to attribute mental states to other people. We also have this other capacity to take these things that are very important to us, that help us understand ourselves and our surroundings, and we have these abilities to attribute them to other things. So there's this famous study. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm a novice at PowerPoint, or I would have tried to embed a video of this, which is much better. But there's this famous study where people looked at this, this video that had big red triangle, this was actually black and white when they first did it, a smaller triangle and a circle. And it's, in one sense, it's just random motion of these dots and triangles moving around. But if you, if you look on that screen, do you see kind of a progression there? What's going on there? The red triangle's chasing and the, yep. the people take protection within the box. Right. And would you guess the small triangle and the, the green dot, are they probably buddies? Yeah. They probably get along, so... Yeah, especially about the last one. <laughs> so I, I, I prompted it a little bit. that They often refer to these studies as a circle and a triangle in love, being chased by the big triangle. This is part of this ability to, have, to project a theory of mind on other objects. 
we're, we're, we're not treating these like shapes that are randomly moving. We're, we're attributing the kinds of things that we attribute to other people to these shapes. We're treating them as agents that have a purpose. And a lot of work has been done on this with young children. And children have this uncanny ability to do this. They tell stories when they see images like that. And they're, they're, they're wonderful. They're fascinating stories. And uh, one of the, the cognitive scientists studying this area calls this a promiscuous teleology. We see agency. We see order. We see design. We see purpose. We project these things onto everything we see. And that's the way our minds are wired. That's the way our, our cognitive functioning is set up to do this. A lot of these studies, and I'm not going to go into any detail on these, that have been done on children also suggest that children are born with a sense of omniscience. Mom and dad know everything until a certain age, <laughs> until a certain number of mistakes that mom and dad make. Mom and dad have power to do everything. If daddy can't do it, it, it can't be done. Unfortunately, my daughters don't believe that anymore, but for a while it was nice when they thought I could do everything. There's actual studies that have been done that say children are kind of natural creationists. The ideas of creationism, that God created everything one time, according to Genesis, that's an idea that's very natural for children. And children also have no problem with immortality. They're just, they're born with their minds set up that things live forever. Mamas and daddies don't die, grandparents don't die, pets don't die. And anybody that's had a child and had to deal with a death, that's a real challenge for them because their minds are not set up for that. And so when you take this whole package, and there, there's more that cognitive science of religion is telling us, a lot of what they're telling us is we have this uncanny ability to function and to survive and to use these for our daily life. But these are actually the same cognitive functions that we use to think about God and to relate to God. God is an agent, an invisible one, but God is an agent out there. God has mental states. We're trying to match our mental, there's a theory of mind, we're trying to match our mental states to God's mental states. Are we doing what God would, would have us do? There's order and design. God is the designer. There's a whole movement called intelligent design that plays on this notion of God as the designer, the one who ordered everything because we want to see order. We try to make order out of everything. And then there's these classic notions within our theology that appear to be innate in how we're cognitively set up. A God that's omniscient, a God that's omnipotent, a God that created, a God that lives much longer than we do, that is immortal. And so we, we, were, we were built this way. We were white. We, we evolved to have these cognitive capacities is what the cognitive science of religion is teaching us. Any questions on that before I move ahead here? Does that mean, do, do people see that connection? Do you see some of those, the ways our minds are set up where religion is natural, to use a term? So Justin Barrett, if you want one book to read after this, he wrote a wonderful book that spells all of this out and more called Born Believers. <coughs> It's written for a mass audience. This is not a technical scientific manuscript. It's very accessible. He talks uh, a little bit uh, about, so as a parent, knowing all of this, what do you do? Knowing that your children have these abilities, do you raise them any differently? He even gets questions like that. But this is a fantastic book. And Justin is one of the few cognitive scientists of religion who's also a Christian. And he uses these things as a way of kind of buttressing religion and faith, where many, many others use it to attack religion. I'll say more about that in just a minute. So one of Justin Barrett's really neat ideas that he's just starting to develop, I don't think he wrote about it in the book, I don't think he's actually really written on it, is Calvin, John Calvin, the great Reformed theologian, had this notion of the sensus divinitas. In us, we have an innate ability to sense, to understand, to know God. And Calvin had no, there was no science he was basing this on. Calvin was developing this as a theologian in the 15th, 16th century. And 
Justin Baird is starting to wonder if the work we're doing in cognitive science of religion is starting to actually prove that Calvin was right. We do have these innate capacities to know and to understand God. Uh, and so keep your eye out for that. My, Justin loves to write for popular audiences, so that may be his next book. <laughs> so I've cast this in a fairly friendly way so far, the way that Justin Barrett does. But there are challenges here, too. Almost everybody who studies in this area is not religious. They may not be antagonistic towards religion, but they're not using this to try to understand or necessarily shed a favorable light on religion. And let me say a little bit more about that. A key term, this is another, this is another point where you turn on and hear one of the key points of my talk um, this morning. Uh, a key thing that happens in the scientific study of religion is scientists often try to use their findings to explain away religion. Not to explain a phenomenon, but to explain it away. So it's not just that we have these capacities, but these capacities may actually be a misfiring or a mistake of our biology. And this gets in, and this, this is where things start to get more complicated. This gets into a set of evolutionary questions in evolutionary biology. And there's this huge debate. There's no, there's no answer to this question right now. But evolutionary biologists are, are in a range of areas, including the cognitive science of religion, the way our minds are set up. They're arguing, did those capacities that we have cognitively, did they evolve as an adaption? Were they beneficial to people? Do they help us? Do they make us better? Do they give us an evolutionary advantage so that natural selection selects for this hyperactive detection device or selects for theory of mind? Or are these a byproduct? And by byproduct, what they mean is, go back. let's go back to the jungle in Africa. There's a clear evolutionary advantage to thinking there's a lion in the woods. Because if there really is a lion in the woods, you want to run. You don't want to stay there and say, oh, I bet that's just the wind. You want to get out of there as quick as you can. There's nothing in that, in that scenario as I just presented it that projects out towards the divine or to God. It's purely a survival mechanism. And so many of the scientists studying this work explain away the use of it in a religious context in the way that I have presented it by saying this is just a survival mechanism we live in the 21st century today. We don't have lions outside of our camps most of the time. We may have a few snakes down here, but we don't have lions. We don't have to worry about this stuff anymore. And so our minds have this capacity, and now they're actually misfiring, and they're applying it to these supernatural beings, rather than applying it to the context where evolution had it. That's the argument of this being a byproduct. And it's often used to explain away. Religion is just these capacities we had way back in the day when we needed them, when we were hunter-gatherers in Africa. We needed these capacities. And now our minds don't need to use them that way, and so they've attributed them in a different way. And so that's where the challenge comes from. And that's where the real, real debate and the difficulty comes. And so I want to pose the theological question. I don't know if I have an answer here. There has not been a lot of theological work, as I said at the beginning, on this. But I'd like to pose the question, does it matter if it's a byproduct or if it's adaptive? We have the capacity. It's there. Does it matter that much how it got there? Ponder that. That's your, that's, that's your real homework. And if you can figure it out, please send me the answer. <laughs> Let me move quickly to, to the neuroscience of religion. Uh, I, I, Can I ask a quick question? Please. You have a lot of people study of the thousand senior citizens federally funded R01. And we've been following senior citizens in Alabama now for 12 years. And we have over 25 publications in top scientific journals that speak to the power of religiosity and spirituality on health. Which mm -hmm. is seems pretty adapted. I mean, it, yep. we've studied it from a variety of different points of view. Yeah, when you go to that question of adaption versus byproduct, you, you blow the doors open on what we're talking about in religion. We're not just talking about the cognitive science. We're talking about a much, ranger, much wider range of phenomena within religion 
and talking about are they adaptive or are they a byproduct. There's a, there's a huge field in the evolution of religion within biology. It's very similar to cognitive science of religion where there's one or two Christians and the vast majority are not. There's a lot of the same phenomena of explaining things away, but you're exactly right. When you go into spirituality and health and other areas, you, you get different evidence that all of that needs to be weighed in answering that question of whether it's an adaptive benefit or a byproduct. These are very complicated questions. This is new science. Uh, most of this science has not been done for more than a couple decades. So the scientists are still figuring things out. Um, they don't have set answers on a lot of these questions yet. If they claim they have set answers, your mind should be questioning that because it's very likely that another decade there will be a different answer that you're hearing. Are there also um, researchers that are doing a combination of the two? I mean, it just seems to me if it's uh, specifically one way or the other, then you're, and I don't, I, and I know scientists tend to do that. They take a premise and then they try and um, <clears throat> prove it. But it seems to me it'd be easy to combine the two, and that's kind of what. By combining the two, you're talking about the, the adaption and the. Adapted. Exactly. Yep. There are different times that it might be. I, I think there are some that are doing that. Most, again, this is a new field, so they're trying to stake their claim one way or the other on where they think the evidence is going to go. But I think you're probably right. There's going to be some sort of a balance, again, when you put all the data together uh, and, and try, to, try to understand what's really going on here. Um, you know, there's. Uh, I'll, I'll, I wasn't planning on doing this, but let me make a, a, an interesting comment from archaeological science. Uh, my past supervisor at the foundation is an archaeologist, loves the stuff. We joke with him, he wants to do everything on stone tablets, not <laughs> you know, the tablets that most of us use these days. Um, so we have funded a, a major project the foundation has uh, at a very ancient civilization in Turkey. It was one of the very first civilizations we found it's the transition from kind of nomadic life, hunter-gatherer life, to settled life. And most people have assumed, most of the scientists assumed, that religion kind of grew out of people living together in communities. There was no religion before that. Religion had no part in this transition. There were economic and, and other advantages to doing so. The research that they're doing on this site in Turkey, it's called Çatalhöyük, is the name of the, the, this huge ancient civilization, is starting now to suggest, it's not definitive yet, but it's starting to suggest that religion is how the, the whole city is set up with this religious kind of forms, structures, the, 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 the technical term they use is a religious cosmology. And you see these sacred houses in certain places and everything's laid out in a certain way that to the scientists now studying it suggests there is, there is a religious idea that is forming how this is settled and that religion is actually the source of this innovation because there's another site not too far away that everybody sees as a religious shrine that these nomadic groups would come to and they're starting to link the two together and say maybe religion is what caused us to leave these hunter-gatherer lifestyles, these nomadic lifestyles and to settle into community. And the, 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 the terms they use is religion is the source of innovation, not the outcome of other sources of innovation. So that would, that would be another argument that would suggest religion might be adaptive. It's many of the cultural changes that we as humans have had have, have come from the benefits of religion, that term I used earlier on in the talk. Any other comments before I quickly move through neuroscience? Let me check our time here. I don't want to go over too far here. All right, so the choir leaves in 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that's my schedule, right? Sorry. So the neuroscience of religion. Probably the most well, well the, actually this work is generally well known because neuroscience is very hot in the media. But there's been a lot of work about how religion can be stimulated in the brain. So there's this old study, the God Helmet. I, I'm, not, I'm not even sure I know exactly what the God Helmet was designed for. It was a different type of experiment. But they throw, there's some sort of light magnetic waves that are, that are run through this helmet. And when you put it on people's head and they were studying them, many of the people, not all, but many of them had these ecstatic religious experiences. And so there became this notion that, that religion is nothing but this field around the head that you can stimulate. And that's all it is. 
That, remember that first quote, we are nothing but our neurons? Well, we're nothing but some magnetic field stimulating our neurons in this example. Many of you might have heard of some of the work on uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. There's a lot of connections between epileptic seizures and religious experience. And this has been studied in some depth. There seem to be some deep connections there. And now there's been a little bit of work um, on basically drugs, chemically induced spiritual or ecstatic experiences. So this kind of data is usually presented as a challenge. These things aren't real. You can stimulate them with a silly looking motorcycle helmet with these little things on it. Religion's not real. That's one way to look at it. That's the way many present it to explain away the phenomena, to explain away religion. Another way to look at it is our brains are set up so that we actually can have religious experiences. And you might be able to stimulate them externally because there is a natural way to have a religious experience. So something is going on in my neurons when I have a deeply spiritual experience. But that doesn't mean I'm wearing that helmet or that I've taken a drug or that I have epilepsy. It just means I have the capacity within my neurons to have these experiences. So there's, there's kind of two ways to look at it. And normally in the media, normally these things are presented as explaining away. But the other way to look at it is, of course we have religious experiences. Of course our brain lights up. And that's the other set of studies I want to talk about very briefly here. Many of you have probably heard about the, the prayer and meditation studies. They get these Tibetan Buddhist monks in their robes, and they sit them down in their laboratory, and they wire their heads with all these electrodes, and they see what's going on. Uh, and most of what they're doing is they're trying to get practitioners of religion to get into a certain religious state and then see where the brain lights up. What lights up? What's, what's different? Uh, and a lot of the activity is in the frontal lobes. It's in the front of your brain where attention and reward often occur. So when you eat a piece of chocolate, the front of your brain lights up. When you have a religious experience, the front of your brain lights up. Now the brain is incredibly complicated. So many people think, so what, that means nothing. The brain lights up all the time. All the parts of the brain light up all the time. But the neuroscientists say, well, there, there's a little more going on here. Maybe there is something interesting. And the parietal lobe is the other area of the brain that often lights up in these. And here's an actual image. You can see the baseline. That's when they're not meditating. And then you can see the meditation. And you see there's actually a reduction in the activity on that kind of bottom right corner of that brain image when they're meditating. And that's the part of the brain where a lot of your sensory experience, where a lot of your visual and other data comes in and where your brain processes it. So that makes sense. When you're meditating, you're not taking on a lot of external stimuli. You're meditating. And so that part of your brain slows down. What I think is probably the most interesting work being done in neuroscience and I've got many colleagues at the foundation that the foundation works with that agree with this, is not just what part of the brain lights up, but does the brain actually change? And this gets at what I said at the beginning, the benefits of religion. This is an example of that. We have, there are many, many, many studies that have been done now. A lot of it is around meditation. Uh, Buddhism is extremely popular in the academy right now. A lot of scientists are studying Buddhism. They're practicing meditation. Uh, there's a whole field in science called, contempl it called contemplative science that includes a lot of neuroscientists and psychologists and others. And there are good established studies that show meditation can reduce stress, can actually change your brain to reduce your stress levels, can change your brain to increase your ability to be attentive, your attention. It can increase compassion, and it can actually, the signs of aging in your brain, it can actually reduce them. People that have meditated for 30 years look like they have a brain half the age of the average person when scientists look at the details there. So there's these, these actual changes that these religious practices have on the biochemistry, on those neurons that are, that are in your mind. And many of them can provide benefits. Uh, we're still learning, I don't think we know the mechanisms 
This is, we know this practice correlates with this change. We don't know how it causes it. That's an important distinction in, in a lot of these discussions. But there definitely appear to be these positive benefits uh, within neuroscience. And so, again, that could be an entire class uh, that, that we could do. And there, there's tons of research and literature out there uh, on these studies and on these changes. Any other comments before I try to wrap us up and open it to more general conversation? Any comments on the neuroscience? Folks, you've seen the neuroscience stuff in the media, right? You see these images and then some claim about how that impacts behavior, and so it's hopefully fairly familiar. So how do we respond to the critics? I gave those two things, the benefits of religion and response to our critics at the beginning. Based on what I just said and what these fields are doing, how do we then form some conclusions? Well, the early indicators are that religion is more natural than atheism. You actually have to train your mind more or less to become an atheist. You're, you're not, the average person is not born that way. You don't see that in Daniel Dennett or Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins in their writings. I think it's important to always realize the scientific description of a phenomena does not explain away that phenomena. It's a very important distinction. And then I would also add all of this scientific study has little or no bearing on our beliefs. There may be some places where it has some when we talk about who we are, if we're made in the image of God, well, we are a natural phenomenon. So it may have some impact on a question like that. But on the resurrection, on the Trinity, on the, most of the Apostles' Creed, there's not going to be much impact here. And Justin Barrett has this wonderful quotation um, that, that I'll just give you a moment. Actually, I'll, I'll read it for you. First, explaining how beliefs come about, no matter how complete the explanation, says nothing about whether a belief is true or justified. It just tells you what the cognitive mechanisms or the neural mechanisms are that are going on in that experience or in that moment. If a cognitive scientist managed someday to fully explain the brain activity and evolutionary history of those brain functions responsible for believing that 17 times 11 equals 187, 17 times 11 would still equal 187. It doesn't change what those two numbers multiplied by each other equal. Similarly, a complete scientific explanation for why humans nearly universally believe that other, other people have minds would not suddenly account against whether humans should believe that other people have minds. So there's this important distinction in what science tells us. Remember, science is studying the natural. That was that first point that I wanted to, to make. Science studies the natural world. It has no comment on supernatural statements. By definition, science cannot study God for supernatural phenomena. All right, here's where it gets tough. Yes, please. One comment because I have to run. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I just wanted to point out that if, peop if a scientist has a biological explanation uh, for any religious phenomenon and argues be on the basis of that that there's um, no connection to God or to creation, they're falling into a serious trap which is directly opposed to what they should have learned as they began their religious training, and that is that you cannot disprove a negative. I mean, they cannot prove a negative. So when they say, if, if you um, can explain all connections in the brain as a religious phenomenon, it means there is no God there not very good scientists. So here's where it gets tricky on the benefit side. This is the harder part. This is the part where we all have a lot more work to do. There's a few places where it's not too hard, but so we see that belief appears natural. I hope that's been clear through some of the cognitive science of religion work. Again, there, there are other examples that we could use through natural systems we have a capacity to believe in, to relate to, and to experience God. We are relational creatures. 
we have these interesting minds, and we have everything we need wired into our, our hardware and our software in order to interact with the Creator God. And generally, these things have evolved over many, many years, and that's where the challenges rise. What kind of God would create these capacities if they were byproducts? If we weren't intentionally designed to develop these capacities so that we could relate to God, does that change anything? Does that change the nature of who God is and how we understand God? That is the, I think that is the number one most challenging question that we have not wrestled with as a church uh, and that people in science and religion have not adequately, actually I think they've wrestled with it, they just don't know how to answer it yet. That's the, that's the really difficult question. Um, and some of it is because we're cognitively wired as creationists. We, you know, that God created all this. To, to, there's, there's order and there's purpose and everything should be very simple. The evolutionary process is not simple. It's not clean. So that, that's the question I think we have to, to wrestle with. The other benefit, which, which I've, I've already mentioned, which again, this could be a whole other set of courses, is that there are religious practices that we are learning more and more about that have real benefits. Um, you know, there was a, there's some mention of uh, spirituality and health and aging. If you are affiliated with a religious community and you have various sorts of illness, mental or physical, you are going to recover quicker than the average person who is not a member of a religious co community. The data pretty clearly shows this. Um, is that because of something in the religious community? That we don't know. It could, it could be the community is the key here, not the religious part. We, we don't know that distinction. But there are real benefits to prayer, to being involved in religious communities, and science is showing us these uh, every day. And there's, there's people in spirituality and health that are wondering if doctors should start prescribing regular church attendance or regular synagogue attendance um, because the outcomes are so much better for those that, that do those things. So there are, there are some real benefits that we're learning here, but you, you still don't get over that difficult question uh, that I asked before. So I think that is, oh, so I, I add one more, and this is just, this is for me. I thrive off these conversations. I've grown off these conversations. Um, God is so much bigger and more incredible in my mind, having spent 15 years doing this work, thinking about these ideas, then it would have been, I can't imagine what it would be like having not done that. A God who created a universe that's 13.7 13 billion years old, that has all this dark matter and dark energy that created brains of the sort that we have that are so complex, but that allow us to have religious experiences and to know and relate to God. These sorts of things have drastically changed my own faith and deepened my own faith. And so I think there's, a, there's a, an important conversation that we all have by wrestling with these issues. I think they make, by doing so, they make the church relevant. Remember, I, I talked a little bit about the growth of religious nuns earlier in the um, presentation. Many of those, I think, they're leaving because we're not having these deep, difficult conversations. Uh, and so I think there's, there's great value here. Um, there's lots of questions still to wrestle with and that everything's not resolved and well packaged. Compliments of God. Historically, I'm so old that I, I know Dave Larson and Harold Coney and others, and uh, had opportunities to work with them. And Dave Larson, while he was at the National Institute of Mental Health, un uncovered the fact that the scientific community had ignored religious spiritual phenomena in their studies, almost in every professional field. And so he paid a dear price for that. He died early, I think. And the American Psychiatric Association gave him uh, a posthumous award. But the Templeton Foundation funded much of his work on faith and health. And so this is a great organization. And thank you for representing them so well today. And I just wanted to mention that bit of history, because now we have religion and spirituality in most of our scientific studies. And if it's not included, we ask why not. So or, you, you. or you call the John Templeton Foundation and ask for funding. We get lots of requests to this day in spirituality and health. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Any other comments, questions? I, I don't know what time you typically wrap up. So if it's time to wrap up, I don't want to people to feel hostage to sit here, but I'm happy to stay a few more minutes and, and chat for those that would like to. Question. Uh, how much of the growth uh, in those who have no particular beliefs would you ascribe to confusion over creation? It's really, really hard to say. There are so many things going on. There's issues of how we deal with other religions, pluralism, globalism, information overload, all the debates over various issues in sexuality. All of these things come up. You know, that most of the nuns were born in the 80s and the 90s. The vast majority of the religious nuns were born in those two decades. Um, and you know, you just reflect on you know, since 1980, what, what are some of the issues? What are the issues religion has wrestled with? Um, Islam has become so much more prominent during that time. And I, I think it's, it's hard to say what's driving what. It probably varies greatly from person to person. I think for someone that grew up in a creationist religious environment and then goes on to school and discovers evolutionary science and decides they want to be a doctor or a biologist or a you know, someone that uses the tools of evolution, it's probably a, a, a very large factor. For the average person that takes bio in high school and never takes it again, my hunch is it's probably not much of a factor. You uh, stated a, a fact or a statistic that 85% of the world mm -hmm. was religious. Now, is that religious? It's 84.7 oh, yeah. or something like that. <laughs> Close enough. Um, is, that, is that a religion or some type of religion that has a supreme being or that it includes supreme being plus other It, it includes issues. the three great monotheisms. It includes the Asian religions. It includes tribal religion. It, it's religion fairly broadly defined. But probably primarily a supreme being. Yes, but the only reason we say that, can say that, is because the majority of the world is Christian or Muslim. Uh, as, as, you know, as population grows, many religious traditions are growing at the same rate. Hinduism, Judaism, are pretty, and, and Buddhism are pretty steady with the growth of their tradition. Only Islam and Christianity are growing more rapidly than you know, average population growth. When you refer to the Spirit's God with a capital yep. so I assume that was part of the assumption. Yeah, and part, and part of it, I, I'm, I think I'm speaking to a Christian community that has that assumption as well. This would be a very different presentation. I'm not sure how you would make it to a Buddhist audience. Well, they still have a supreme being. Mm -hmm. that type, that Others? All right, thank you very much. I appreciated the opportunity to be here and hope you found a few take home points that will help you the next time you read your newspaper and see neuroscience claims this. Evolution claims that you have some tools to, to reflect on that. Thank you. Thank you.